Hey everybody, it's Chris Guns. Welcome back to Pro Box and Insider Radio. And in this segment, I'm going to be joined by Jamie Cavanaugh, the young man that a lot of boxing people expect to be the next big thing from Ireland. Maybe Jamie could be this generation's Barry McGuigan or Wayne McCullough. But Ireland always seems to have a guy at the top of the game or close to it. So let's go and, and see what Ireland's new favorite son, Jamie Cavanaugh, got to say after he trains at the wildcard gym for his fight coming up tomorrow night on the undercard of Khan and Garcia. And I want to ask him about what it's like for a guy 10-0 and 0 like himself sparring with all-time great fighters like Manny Pacquiao and really good fighters like Amir Khan and learning from one of the best trainers in the game at Freddie Roach. So let's go ahead and see what Jamie has to say. Jamie Kavanaugh, how you doing? Fight night tomorrow. How you feeling? Yeah, I'm feeling good. You know, uh, ready for tomorrow. Just waiting today. Everything's good and weight, weight was fine. And just putting all, this, all the nutrients back into the body, you know, and just getting ready for fight night. Mm -hmm. And you're the newest hope of Ireland. Tell me about where you're from, Jamie. I'm from Dublin, Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, I, moved to, I moved to Spain when I was 10 years old, but I'd, I'd already been boxing in Ireland, you know, so my, my first thing was when I moved to Spain was like, I had to find a new gym and, and keep it the boxing, you know, and kind of, it was the only thing I had. So really, really that way, you know. Yeah. What kind of place is it to grow up in, in Dublin, as far as boxing uh, goes? Uh, it's, it's a nice place to, to grow up as a kid in, in Dublin, you know, but like, where where I come from in Dublin, like you can easily get it, it's it's not it's not a really bad neighborhood, but it's not a good neighborhood, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's good it's good to kind of get out of it too and open your eyes and see the rest of the world like I did. Mm -hmm. My family in that moved to Spain uh, for business, you know, and really just I didn't have a say. I just had to go go with them. Mm -hmm. At the time, I didn't want it. I didn't want to really uh, move because I had my friends, my family, and I thought like the world was ending. Mm -hmm. But it's probably the best thing I ever done was leave Dublin and leave Ireland, you know, because if I hadn't, maybe I'd be doing some some stuff I shouldn't be doing, and also the the boxing, you know, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't be doing the boxing. Yeah, take take me inside the Kavanaugh household. What was it like growing up in your house? Uh, growing up in the house it was like I was a lonely child for ten years. And um, like I always, if I wanted something, I'd always, I, I would like, but have to earn it. But they, but I would get it if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't really that my parents were rich or anything like that. It was more like, just a, my dad was like a thing. If, if, if I wanted it, but then he would go and he'd find a way how to get it. You know what I mean? And it's like that, that, that was great. Yeah. And what kind uh, of for me when I was growing up, but also I had the end. I didn't get everything I wanted. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, keeps you humble. So, you can't have everything. Yeah, of course. It, you, like you have to stay humble and don't forget where you come from. And I, I'll never forget where I come from. Yeah. So you were always a, a, a humbled kid and a grounded kid. Yeah, like always, you know, um, because uh, also with, if I if I stood out alone, like I'll, I'll be the first one to get to get a whack, you know, but. <laughs> but <laughs> that's just the way I was in, in my house, you know. I, I knew if I was getting a whack, it was for something, you know. I knew where I was getting it. I would get told where I was getting it, and then I would get it. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. it kind of sucks when you're getting it. <laughs> yeah. What's the sense of being a, an Irish family if you if you don't give it to your kids a little bit here and there? <laughs> you know? You got to give it. You, you got to give them spanking. No, like, I'm a big believer in that, you know. When I'm a little bit older and I see kids, like, yeah. Some kids, some kids are really bad and <laughs> nasty, you know, and sometimes they need it, but yeah. it's like, it just shows you, shows you, always the, always the one that they get the beat and always turn out good, <laughs> always happens, you know, they always get it when they get the beat and always turn out good, it's the other ones that, that don't and they, they forget themselves and <laughs> so, like, their life goes in a different way, really. It toughens you up, though. Look, look, what, you, yeah, yeah. look what you're doing. Hey, who got you involved in boxing to begin with? Uh, boxing was always like a part of the family, you know. Um, like my cousins had boxed my uh, my uncles, so just really, 
it was really my uncle Paul that got me into boxing because he was the same. He was only two years older than me, but me and him were like kind of brothers. Mm -hmm. I mean, used to like with brothers, best friends, you know, and we used to go everywhere. So he joined. He actually joined the gym one day to to go and beat someone up that was in the gym. And I followed him, you know, like yeah, he's gonna join the gym. I'm gonna join the gym. And then um, he done well as a boxer. Um, the boy actually that he wanted to beat up in the gym left the gym, and we stood in the gym. We just carried on training, and he ended up winning a, like a, an All Ireland championship. I know he ended up winning All Ireland champions, but he left it, and I eventually just kept doing it. And here I am today, you know. And mm -hmm. well, I'm in Vegas now, but I'm boxing now in Hollywood, California. Now, when when your uncle Paul hears that you're in Vegas, is he is he kind of jealous? Yeah, yeah, he just saves <laughs> me sometimes. Oh, I wish I could have stayed on, but like that that's the thing with boxing. It's a whole package. It's not just the talent. He was very talented, but he didn't really have the discipline that I had, you know. And also, I moved to Spain, so I didn't have a lot to do in Spain. The only thing I could do was really go train and after school and kind of plan my day around boxing, you know, boxing in school, where he was, he was back in Ireland, and he was, he had a lot going on, you know, he had, like, he lost interest to a, a lot of horses, he owns a lot of horses, you know, mm -hmm. so, he lost interest to that, but now he's, uh, like, he's kicking himself, but it's like, it's a healthy, if you know what I mean, it's healthy, mm -hmm. he's happy for me, and everything's going well. And you moved from Dublin to Spain when you were 11. How'd that move come about? How, how'd you yeah. decide to do that? Yeah, we just, like, as I said, the family, you know, they, they said they're moving, and I was 10 years old. I said to them, I'm not going, I'm not going, but at yeah. 10 years old, you don't really have a say, you know. And yeah. I, I, I also was looking to my friends, family, school, new school, a different language, you know what I mean? I was, I was, like, when they told me, I just started crying. I didn't want to go, but mm -hmm. like I said, you don't, mm -hmm. you don't, you don't have a say when you're ten years old. Yeah. You, you can go, or you can get, or, you, or they make you go. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. Yeah. And who did you look up to growing up? Uh, look up to growing up was really would be my uncle Paul. You know, that's who I would look up because he was he was two years older. Mm -hmm. And like I said, when he joined the boxing gym, I joined the boxing gym. Anything he wanted to do, I wanted to do. Anything he wanted to get, I wanted to get. You know, I just wanted to be like him. And mm -hmm. thanks to him as well that I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm still in the boxing. You know, because like if, if he hadn't that day he wanted to beat up that kid and mm -hmm. and uh, join join the gym, I wouldn't have joined it. Yeah, I was expecting you to say maybe Wayne McCullough or something like that, but. <laughs> oh, you know, like box, boxing people, pff, I, I don't know, they didn't really, I, didn't, I, I knew what the boxers were on that, but I didn't really follow it, you know, it, mm. it was, like when I was that young, I didn't really follow the boxers, because when, when I was a kid, kid, I didn't want to look at boxing, you know what I mean, I, I liked it, the sport, and I was on TV, I'd watch it, but I didn't really follow it, mm -hmm. and then when I started getting involved in boxing, there wasn't a lot of people in Ireland that, that was kind of... Like Wayne McCullough, Steve McCollum. Um, then all of a sudden, this guy, Bernard Dunn, came along, you know. Mm -hmm. Before him, it was Ricky Hatton. And I used, I was a little bit older, a little bit worried, and, and I was like, I, I followed his career a lot, you know. So he was the closest thing to Ireland yeah. that we had in the boxer. And then I followed his career, and then eventually I started to follow Bernard Dunn's, you know. Mm -hmm. And you had an amateur record of 168 wins, 12 losses, an incredible record. And, and you're a seven-time Irish national champion. And yeah, it, it, it's a great record to have, you know. It really helps me in the in the professional, you know. A lot of people, like there's a lot of Mexican people, a lot of American people, they only have like 12 fights, 40 fights. And mm. They're good, but it's like, it's the boxing, it's the boxing, they it's not, like in Europe, you have a lot of amateur fights. Back where we're coming from in Dublin, in Crumlin Boxing Gym, nice. uh, you, can, you can fight every week. If you want to fight every week, you can fight every week. And that's the way, like, there's, no, there's not a lot of regulations either, you know. You don't need a boxing card. Some, sometimes I've, I've showed up and I've fought and I haven't had a boxing card, you know. Or mm. I've, used, I've used someone else. Yeah. Looks like, you know, if you want to fight, you, you, you're going to get a fight. That's right.
And then, then you, you won a silver medal at the 2008 Youth Amateur Boxing Championships. Did you have Olympic dreams? Yeah, like, <clears throat> not dreams. I didn't have dreams. It was like, it was that, when I won the, the, the World Junior Medal, it was yeah. like, now that was, it happened to be on Olympic year, you know, when I, I tried for the, for the Olympics and I got beat by John George Joyce. Who went down and, and lost in the qualifying? He 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 done he done uh, he done, done all and proud, you know. But uh, I believe if, if you want to go to the Olympics, like I tried, but I didn't dream about. That. But if you want to go to the Olympics, you need to be dreaming about it, you know. You need to be eat, sleep, and it wasn't me. It was like I always want. I didn't believe in medals. I always wanted doubt. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, like. Uh, me standing there with a with a medal around my neck wouldn't really do a lot for me. It was more like me standing with a belt around my waist is, it was a bigger dream, you know. Yeah, yeah. And and so it didn't devastate you to miss the Olympics. We're not devastated. No, it was it was no because when I it, it kind of missed out too with, with my age, you know. I was only seventeen, so no. I was still a junior, but I was also just becoming an like. An elite fighter, you know, like a senior, and mm-hmm. um, it was like it just messed up. It messed up, you know. They said they offered me to stay on and go to these Olympics in 2012, but I didn't want to wait around. And it's you know, you know, you never guaranteed anything, you know. So I thought I want to bring it into my own hands and and do it that way. Yeah, and you decide to turn pro in America. So you move again. Did you did you come from Argentina to LA or did you go from Ireland to LA? No, Spain. Oh, it was Spain. I went from Ar- like it's I'm from Dublin, Ireland. And then you moved to Spain. Spain. Yeah. Now I lived in Spain for ten years, and then like when I was ten years old, I moved to Spain, and then when I was nineteen, I moved from Spain to to uh, the work at gym in Hollywood, California. So mm. I come from Spain, yeah. Yeah, and and. When when you first decided to uh, work with Freddie Roach, how, how did that come along? Yeah, I had a I had a buddy Dean Bourne, and he was training in the gym, and uh, we was actually at the Ricky Hatton uh, Manny Pacquiao fight, and uh, Dean was fighting the night before, and I got talking to Dean's manager Stephen Feder, who's my manager now, with Freddie Roach, and they said, "Hey, come to the World Cup, try it out, see what's good." Like to tell you the truth, they didn't think I was coming. I yeah. just came home from that trip one day and I said to my mom and dad, I had a long think about it. I said, I'm going to mm-hmm. go to America, you know? Mm-hmm. And they, they was like, really? He says, yeah, I'm going to America. I want to turn professional. And they were very supportive, but they knew it was hard, you know? It, it's a lot harder than what I, I even thought back then, you know? Yeah. But it was something I wanted to do, it was something in my mind, and I knew I had to do it because I didn't want to be one of them people that, you know, I could have done it, I should have done it, but never did. Yeah, more people should do it, too. It's about where you go, you know. It's way better and way easier to find great teachers of the sport in L.A. than it is Ireland. Yeah, well, there was always a chance of me going to England, but I knew boxing, like, the, 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 high, the high class of boxing isn't, it's not in England, it's in, it's in America, you know. Yeah. At the end of the day, if you do good in England... You're eventually gonna have to make that jump to America, yep. you know, over the Atlantic. But it's like it's one of them things I thought, you know, I either make it in America or I don't make it. So that was it. And I hooked up with Freddie Roach. He he wanted to sign me. Uh, I stayed for a month and walked out. I sparred with everyone in the gym. I was tested really hard and that. But they walked out for me, and then I came. I went back, sorted out my visa. And then uh, I saw him with Golden Boy promotions, you know, yeah. Oscar De La Hoya, which was also another dream come true, you know, he's a, he's a legend of the sport. Yeah. How, how does he approach you, and, and how, how does it feel to be approached by Oscar De La Hoya? It feels great, you know, like, he's such a, such a big name and such a, like, he, he, he's a big figure in, in professional boxing. And um, where I speak Spanish, you know, we kind of hit it off because... I can speak, like I'll speak to him in English, and then he'll speak to me in English, but then I'll answer him back in Spanish, and mm-hmm. he'll, he'll just be scratching his head, you know, <laughs> like even the press conference, 
we had yesterday for the can gas here, yeah, they, they blown me up when I was speaking. I thought, you know, if I speak English, I won't speak Spanish. And they were saying, we want you to speak Spanish. So we just started the press conference off in Spanish. They said, hey, we got Jamie Cavan from Dublin, Ireland. <laughs> up here to talk, Let, let's bring him up. And, you know, they, they introduced me. And everybody was waiting for me, you know, Dublin, Ireland, to speak English. Mm. I just started off in Spanish and people was like, laughing they was like whoa that's crazy you know people a lot of people approach me after and it was it was cool that's going to help with your marketability later that's great well that that's it when i was i had i actually had a fight in mexico and then after the fight i spoke to the crowd in spanish and they was going nuts and coming up to me and saying like how did you speak spanish like they they approach you more you know because they kind of they like you yeah. in a way yeah, and, and the first time you you walked into the wild card gym, what did you see, and who did you see? Uh, when I first went into the wild card boxing gym, was to me like as I said, they didn't think I was gonna come, you know. So I went up to the desk and I said, "Hey, I'm Jamie Cavanaugh. I've been speaking to Stephen Fader, this and that, and I've been doing this and I've been doing that." And they was like, "Hey, here's the form. I gave you one, you know. Join the gym. Here's the forms. Fill it out." They was like, "Ah, oh, yeah, just another foyer." Mm-hmm. And then I had, like, that's it. I had to, I started sparring for, like, Jose Benavides. A lot of other kids were there trying out, too. And all, like, uh, Ray Beltran. Uh, a lot of experienced guys, you know, when I was holding my arm with them. And then people kind of started to turn their head and, and say, hey, who's this kid, you know? And then Freddie was actually away because I think um, Pacquiao was, yeah, well, Pacquiao was fighting Miguel Cotto. Mm-hmm. So he was in the Philippines training. Pagio. And then uh, when I came back, people were saying, hey, this kid, Jamie, check him out. And kind of that way, you know, I was actually sparring with Guillermo Rigondeau. Mm-hmm. I think he's a super bantam weight champion now. Yeah. Like uh, best in the world. Like, like amateur, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, he, he's also a lot smaller than me, but like uh, people in the gym, they, they couldn't touch him. Mm-hmm. But where they had a good amateur career, I was kind of on the same on the same note, and I could kind of use my swords and use my reach and all, and, and get at them. And they were, they were surprised with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so you held your own with with Rigando. Yeah, I held my own with Rigando. And obviously, like when you say it like that, you say, "Oh, you held your own with Rigando." But the girl, like, if you don't, if he doesn't want you to hit him, you're not going to hit him. That's mm-hmm. the way it is. Yeah. You know what I mean? People, people say, "Yeah, he's a super bander, my Jamie's a lightweight." Of course he's gonna hit him because he's so much bigger. But trust me, that guy's <laughs> there's something about that guy. He's special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think about Nonito not fighting him? <laughs> Doesn't want to fight. Yeah, him. that that's a big fight that everyone wants to see. And to tell you the truth, uh, like uh, I'm not surprised Nonito doesn't want to fight him because mm. I I believe he'll make Nonito look bad. You know. Yeah, yeah me too. Um, Nonito's been fighting all these like. Um, he he's been fighting like this this last guy, yeah, uh, Mutabla or something like that yeah. from South Africa. He was six foot one. Yeah. He was trying on the World Cup, yeah. and he's come up with like with all these awkward guys. But I do believe uh, Rigondeaux will be too awkward for him, and yeah. he'll just make him look ordinary. That's what he does. Yeah, and you made your pro debut on the undercard of, of Amir Khan and Victor Ortiz fight May twenty ten. And you turn pro at the Mecca, Madison Square Garden. What's that like to be fighting your first fight at the Mecca and, and the most popular building in sports? Yeah, that, that's it. You know, like when I saw the Garden Boy, I said to him, because that happened to be like that date. You know, there's a lot of Irish support in New York too. Mm-hmm. And I, I do want to fight on the East Coast a lot more. Yeah. So, like to, to fight in Madison Square Garden, it's everybody's dream. Yeah. You know, I fought in Madison Square Garden, I fought in Las Vegas, I fought <clears> in Texas, I fought in Cancun, a lot of people like Las Vegas and and, um, and New York, like Madison Square Garden, that's a lot of people's dreams and I got, I got to do that yeah. in the fourth year of my uh, boxing career, so it's very privileged, you know, and I'll never forget it, but hopefully one day, like, I'll be... <laughs> Doing my own headline in Madison Square Garden. Yeah, on St. Patrick's Day weekend. That's yeah, I hope, I hope I can you see. know, like, that's what I said. There's a lot of support 
for his support in New York and it would be great to get more fights over there on the East Coast. Even like Detroit, uh, Atlantic City, but anywhere, you know, Philadelphia, like there's big uh, Irish support over there. And, uh, did you feel... Give it to the fans. Yeah. Did you did you feel overwhelmed at all on, on a card like that in your first fight? Or were you ready for it? Um, no, you know, because when I fought, like, I, I fought, like, in my manager, uh, he was worried. Because he was saying, have you ever fought in, in front of so many people? And I said to him, I said, probably not that many people, but I fought in the big crowds, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, in Ireland and, and in the World Championships and the finals, you know? But it really wasn't an issue issue to me because I was just there to do my work and I'm like very professional about it. Like I, the crowd scream and shout, but there's you ask any boxer, like you, you can't make out any of the words that the crowd shout. It's just all a big blow. Yeah. Do you remember who you fought and what the result was? Yeah, well, it was like William Way, and I knocked him out. It was a TKO and the. In the second round, I believe. And that's it. And, and, and then a few fights later, you, you fought Sid Razek. Yeah, I fought that guy in England. Uh, yeah, Sid yeah. Razek, he's, he's a well-known journey man from England. Mm -hmm. had like, I think it was like, I don't know, he had like 60 losses or something like yeah. that. I think, he, I think <laughs> he's actually gone over the 100 mark now. <laughs> oh, wow. He's been active. Yeah, yeah. If you look him up, he's gone over 100 fights and he's still going. Wow. It's it's crazy in England the way they keep letting these people fight. Like they they don't lose a lot by knockout. So maybe that's where, you know, there's there's less people in um in England than they like the journeyman kinda of just survive. Mm -hmm. But you come to California, you come to like 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 I said, California, Los Angeles and you fight Mexicans and they come to win. Yeah, yeah. You now even even though they got them dodgy records and stuff like that. Oh yeah. Two and seven and Four and four, you think, oh, it's an easy night. It's never an easy night with the Mexican. No, it's not. That's, that's Actually, Larry Merchant always says that, too. Four and four in Mexico is different than four and four in, in Missouri or Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. like, there's a, there's a big difference. But you don't realize the difference until you, you actually take the punch or, or throw the punch and, and you're in the fight, you know? Yeah. And take me back to the night you... you the only night you didn't get a W in, in your pro fight, you fought Ramses Hill? Ramses yeah, Hill? Yeah, Ramses Gill, he's a very strong kid. Yeah. Actually, uh, I fractured my hand in the second round, and I, I still got the, I'm, I'm just looking at the bump now, you know, it's, it's still big. Mm. Uh, and then the fourth round was, was a clash ahead. I got a nasty cut on my, uh, over my right eye. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, it was a, I thought I, I thought I won the fight on point. You know, I, I was the better boxer and stuff like that, but I don't know, that night it was like, Khan also had his loss, and there was a lot, like even people say, the commission that night, like, they didn't, they didn't really know how to handle a world championship boxing fight. Not that I was fighting in a world championship boxing fight, but like, the hand wraps, like, they didn't know, they didn't have a clue what they was doing. Mm -hmm. They was wrapping my hands, and the, get my hands wrapped and the girl was like hold on hold on wait there I don't know if you can do that if you can do this and he didn't have a clue he wasn't even looking at the hand wraps but then he would just suddenly come over and say hey what are you doing I said wrap my hands I told you 15 minutes ago uh hold on one second he run out of the room and run back and it was just like kind of a big mess up hmm. I had that feeling but and then I got the draw so I don't know but I learned a lot from that draw and I, I believe it'll come back stronger yeah, that, it's kind of sad that there's not an official way to wrap hands, or, or every every person that sees it, it, it's different in boxing. Yeah, it needs. Yeah, well, kind of it's like yeah, anybody that wraps hands always wraps them different too. So it's a hard one to call. But like, I'm not I'm not, I'm not just talking about the hand wraps. I'm talking about like mm -hmm. it's hard to tell you now all the top of my top of my mind. But there was a lot of stuff. Like all the commission was. They, I don't know. If you would say, like, I'd say they're really old, you know? Mm -hmm. Obviously, if they're old, they've got a lot of experience, but it didn't really look like they had a lot of experience. It was just like there was old age and a bit F and a bit blowing. Yeah. Yeah. And how'd you feel leaving leaving without the win that night? Did it? Yeah, it was very frustrating, you know? As I said, I thought I got the win, but mm -hmm. um, I didn't. 
I ended up, I didn't even see the main event, though. It was in the hospital getting stitches. Yeah. I got 14 stitches out of my eyes. Out of my eye, you know, it was, a, it was a nasty deep cut, seven on the inside and seven on the outside. But, like, leaving the hospital then, I felt okay. I was just like, I'm going to come back stronger and do it that way, you know? Yeah. Was the cut even fully healed for your next fight? You fought Caesar Cisneros on the undercard at Dean yeah. Garcia. Yeah, no, it was, you know, because they stitched are really good and mm -hmm. I got some treatment when I back, went back to Spain and stuff like that. But, yeah, it was, like... It was pretty bad. It was a pretty bad um, court. Like I needed a, a lot of time and a lot of recovery. Yeah. And, and what do you remember about your last fight with Cisneros? That's on the undercard of Danny Garcia and, and another legend, Eric Morales. Yeah, that that was a great card to be a part of and fight under the, the great, you know, Eric mm -hmm. Morales. Uh, that, that was that was my last fight. The, the fight. the last fight was actually against. Jorge Ibarra in uh, Mexico, but yeah, this is this is now. So it was like, the kid was put. Like, he was Mexican. He mm -hmm. was tough. Like he took a lot of shots. Uh, he, I put him down in the first round, and he didn't try to run away or survive. He was there to win and take, you know, take take my first um, L. Yeah. But like, he was, yeah, it was a great. It was a good fight, you know. I was happy because I got. I got like I think it was four rounds out of six, mm -hmm. and then um, like I could have I felt like I could have stepped on the gas and and closed the goal, and that's where I I stepped on the coach and the fifth going into the fifth round. I said, "What round is this?" He said, "This is the fifth round." I said, "Okay, let's step on the gas," and I did, and I got him out of there. Mm -hmm. Just but I was I was enjoying myself too much, probably in there. <laughs> yeah, you. you had your rounds and, and you got your stoppage so everything worked out yeah it couldn't it couldn't have, couldn't have went uh, any good you know you go in and you and you knock kid, kids out in the fourth round or second round you don't really get to get into second gear and that like I, if you want to progress in your career you need to you need that you know to get the rounds in and tough durable opponent and then when you feel like it like get them out of there you know mm-hmm and what do you know about your opponent tomorrow night, Paul Velarde? I don't know much about him. I know he's, he, his record is 3-1-3. Three, three. Mm -hmm. uh, hasn't really been active. He, he, the last time he fought was like a year ago. So, I don't know. We'll go in there. Like, this is my first eight rounds. So, like I said, I, I want to do some rounds too. Mm -hmm. do you have any... I don't wanna do that. Maybe I don't, don't want to do them all. Mm -hmm. Like I should, but... Mm -hmm. uh, We'll see, you know, we'll, we'll take a break. round one. Like I said, I don't know anything about this kid. I just kind of, I'm kind of a bit blind going into it. I'm sure he's seen tape on me and stuff like that, but just take a little bit, little. Mm -hmm. see how it goes. Yeah, and in the gym, you, you spar with Amer Khan and Manny Pacquiao to prepare, didn't you, for this fight? Not for this fight. I just sparred because Pacquiao was gone, you know. No, I, uh, I didn't spar, I didn't spar Pacquiao for the last fight. Bradley, I was bad at me a can just once or twice, you know, because I needed more rounds and they was just giving me four rounds at mm -hmm. a time and it was they they spy in the afternoon so it's hard to get spy partners to come in. Mm -hmm. So it was good, you know, to get in and move around my can and uh, and then go do my own work, you know. I was spying the likes of uh, Ray Beltran. He uh, he put Hank Lundy next weekend. Uh, for um, on Atlantic City, I believe, and then uh, there was a lot of other guys. I was playing uh, Andre Kilimov, he's a USBC champion, I think. USBC. Um, no, there's there's a lot of people that come in the work hard, and, yeah. and you always get decent sparring, you know. Yeah, you're lucky to be there. It's a great place. Yeah, very lucky. Yeah, and and what what does Manny show you? That you're thankful for when when you do spar with him, does he does he do give you any tips? Like, Manny will come over to you at the end of the spar and then he'll he'll someday he won't come over to you, you know, because he's got a lot of people around him and stuff like that. But someday he'll come over to you and say stuff like, "I liked the when he was moving your feet, you know, mm -hmm. not staying still. It was harder, the different attacking angles and stuff like that." And he say like you're fast or you felt your power and stuff like that. But like it's hard to learn. A lot in like skill work against Manny Pacquiao. It's more of the experience and being able to the high tempo and the sparring and 
like also as well getting away from the sponges and mm-hmm. not staying too long and like I said it's in and out and quick fast course of span does uh, fighting a southpaw give you any more problems than an orthodox fighter um, yeah but, but not really because he's not like a normal southpaw fighter because he attacks from all angles he's a bit he's, that's why he's different than everyone else you know it's pretty weird sparring him because you're you're thinking he's a southpaw but you don't really fight like you don't they don't they don't fight like southpaws but he don't you know because he's very aggressive where a southpaw would be more of waiting, you know, kind of draw you in, draw you in, and then finish. Yeah, and, and Amir Khan, what makes Amir so effective at what he does? Like, people always ask me this, who's, a, who's this, and how's that, who'd win up for you, and, mm-hmm. like, <laughs> Amir Khan is, he's a lot, I think he's faster than Manny Pacquiao on Hampstead, but Manny Pacquiao hits harder, and his, Manny Pacquiao's feet is, is a, uh, He's a lot. He's, he's a lot quicker than me at time, You know, he can create space really, really quickly. Yeah. Get in around you and make, like get in, get around, let mm-hmm. his shots off, which were more, a lot stronger and, a, and very fast. You know, there's there's like a, a hairline mm-hmm. in the speed, but I would say that I mean, it kind of is like faster. It all depends on who gets off forward, I believe. Yeah, and why is Danny Garcia so dangerous to him? You saw him fight Eric Morales in person. What would you make of Danny Garcia? Danny Garcia is, is a young, strong player, and like Khan, I don't, I, I don't think Khan's gonna stay in front of him. But if he does, he has a tough night in Danny Garcia. Mm-hmm. Danny's a bit wild sometimes when he tries to punch. Just like, but well, I don't know if he's, he's wild or he's not wild, but he has a lot of power. So, so I mean, maybe that that's why he's so strong because the world was punches. Like, so, if you look with the fight when he fought Eric Morales, mm-hmm. um, Eric Morales was able to catch him and bo- box him a little bit, you know. But yeah. Eric Morales don't have the speed I mean, he can have. Mm-hmm. He can't beat him to the punch every time. But I don't know. Hey, we'll find out tomorrow night, right? Yeah. And what do you expect to see? You expect to see America create angles and not stand in front. I think Khan creates angles with his, like, he's really fast on his feet mm-hmm. and his uh, hand speed and he beats Danny to the punch every time, you know. I don't think Danny's ever fought anyone or spied anyone with the speed that Khan has in his mm-hmm. hands, you know. And it's going to be, it's going to be a real shock. I have Khan winning on points or maybe stoppage, but I don't believe the stoppage will come from knockout. It will be, come from like, I don't know. I don't see his dad thrown in the towel, but I see maybe the ref calling it TKO and calling the fight, but hey, like I said, we don't know. Right, we'll see tomorrow night. And and one more question about the uh, big British fight, bad blood going on. What, what do you make of the David Hay, Chisora fight? The Hay and, and Chisora? Yeah. I think if David Hay don't knock out Derek Chisora, <laughs> he's got a tough night, you know. I'm a, I'm a big fan of David Chisora. Not, not, not the way he acts and what he does and stuff like that. In the boxing world, you know, you, you can't forget the guy is a great boxer. Like mm-hmm. He's more of an old type of style, you know, like a, like a Joe Fraser type. You walk you down, he'll take punches and shoulder roll and come back. And David Hay is a lot quicker and probably punches a little bit harder. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Like heavyweight, they all punch hard. They just gotta hit you on the on the right spot. Mm-hmm. So I, I have I have David Hay winning on stoppage. I think maybe they was just all on point. Hmm. Yeah, sounds good to me. Thank you, Jamie Cavana, and good luck tomorrow night. Appreciate talking okay. to you. Thank you. Thanks, Woody. Take it easy.